The Bayon Bridge is a sight to behold. It is one of the four bridges that connect Staten Island with the rest of the world, which says a lot, as there was a time when going to and from Staten Island was a massive hassle. In fact, at the time of its completion, it was the longest steel arch bridge in the world, a record it held for about 45 years. Even the Bayonne Commune in France congratulated the US government for this achievement. So join me as we discover the history of New York's Bayonne Bridge. I'm your host Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. The Staten Island Ferry is regarded as the busiest ferry route in the entirety of the United States. The Orange Boat has been a staple of the city for years, but its role and function has changed over time. These days, it's an exciting activity, a fun ride, but for a long time, it was the only way to reach the secluded borough. Even the Lenape Native Americans used boats to traverse the waterways, and by the early 18th century, private boats started moving residents to and from Staten Island. Cornelius Vanderbilt, the Staten Island entrepreneur who would go on to become one of the richest people on the planet, started a ferry service in 1810 that connected the island to Manhattan. An action that in fact was all part of a much greater scheme, as the then US Vice President Daniel D. Tompkins secured a charter for the Richmond Turnpike Company in 1817, in order to develop the village of Tompkinsville, which would rely on this ferry service. However, in 1838, Vanderbilt bought the company and in turn expanded the ferry service. After changing hands a couple of times, the ferry ultimately ended in the hands of the city of New York. While the ride may have been charming and fanciful, it was not practical. Times were changing, and so was transportation. The state government of New York and New Jersey understood this all too well. An interstate authority called the Port Authority of New York was established in 1921 to improve regional transportation and promote metropolitan commerce. To put it simply, the body had to ensure there were enough tunnels, seaports, airports, and of course bridges to facilitate efficient commutes. And Staten Island was a major bottleneck for growth. For context, let's have a look at this map. If you didn't know any better, you'd almost assume that this landmass belongs to New Jersey. But the answer is obviously no, Staten Island became one of the five major boroughs of New York. And the reasons for this are, let's just say, complicated. Some oral fables talk about a captain who sailed around the island within 24 hours and claimed it for New York. Yes. I realize that sounds absurd, so let's just say that for one reason or another, the island became part of New York. But you can't change geography, can you? New Jersey was not going anywhere, so the Port Authority planned three bridges to connect it with Staten Island. The reasons were straightforward. They wanted free-flowing traffic in the greater New York metropolitan region. A network of highways and bridges would ensure this. The first was the Outer Bridge Crossing, named after the Authority's first chairman, Eugenius H., Outer Bridge that connecting Perth Amboy, New Jersey to New York, with the Gothos Bridge connecting New York to Elizabeth, New Jersey. The first two bridges finished construction in 1928 and 1931, when finally the Bayonne Bridge connected Bayonne Hudson County, New Jersey to Port Richmond, Staten Island. The latter was constructed so that people who worked in Lower Manhattan but lived in Staten Island could commute easily. The Holland Tunnel was also constructed in 1927 for similar purposes. Both structures would help reduce the traffic load on the Outer Bridge and the Gothels. And critically, both allowed direct access to Manhattan from the borough. The first two bridges were up and running, but the third was still in its planning phase. The Port Authority was weighing its options. Some earlier plans proposed building a tunnel, but these were abandoned. The authority insisted that the structure should be future-proof and accommodate potential rapid transit tracks. The top brass called upon Swiss-American civil engineer Othmar H. Amman and his consulting architect Cass Gilbert for the job. They instructed them to design a structure that would be both functional and beautiful. To comply with the demands, they put on their thinking hats and went for something a little different. The bridge originally carried a walkway and two lanes in each direction, but could be altered to accommodate additional lanes. Transportation planners thought that given the growing traffic volumes, the bridge would prove too narrow within the next few decades. 
The bridge's design was based on New York City's 1917 Hellgate Bridge, the longest steel arch bridge in the world at the time, which you can also learn about in our previous video. Anyhow, Amon had previously worked on the project as a chief assistant to engineer Gustav Lindenthal, but his love for bridges was much older than that. A bridge in the town of Schaffhausen had reportedly inspired the Swiss-born Amon to pursue engineering. He graduated from Zurich's prestigious Polytechnic and made his way to the United States. After analyzing the collapse of the Quebec Bridge that killed 75 people in 1907, he became a part of major projects like the George Washington Bridge and, of course, the Bayonne Bridge. He was humble but ambitious, and his plans reflected that attitude. He developed a scheme for a single arched shaped truss to cross the underlying Kill Van Kull Strait. In the opening ceremony, he explained his decision in the following choice of words. Quote, the Port Authority recognized the fact that its structures must not only be useful, but they must also conform to the aesthetic sense. This was one of the motives for the selection of an arch spanning the entire river in one sweeping, graceful curve. Since the bridge has to cross a body of water, common sense dictates that the structure should be placed at a right angle to save resources. But contrary to popular wisdom, the site selected for construction crossed the strait at a 58 degree angle towards the shoreline, lining up perfectly with the Bergen Point ferry route. To play the devil's advocate, yes, the bridge would be longer and hence would require more resources. That, however, was not the case. The idea seemed nonsensical at first glance, but doing so proved beneficial by preserving the street pattern for both towns saving the city overhead costs. Accommodating the towns was great, but the authority also had to preserve the shipping lane below. The passageway from the Atlantic Ocean into Newark Bay and the Hackensack and the Passaic River was a key shipping channel to the ports of Newark and Elizabeth. So the roadway was designed to be 151 feet above water level, offering water level clearance for the US Navy's tallest ships at the time. Amon and Gilbert introduced two viaducts at either end. The Port Richmond Viaduct was around 2,000 feet long, and the Bayonne Viaduct was around 3,000 feet long, supported by piers ranging from 20 to 110 feet. These approach viaducts allowed the ships to pass under the suspended road deck under the central arch, and achieving this was no simple task. Most arches are built using a temporary support system that mirrors the curve, but following that model would have compromised one of the busiest shipping lanes in the world. So Amon had to get creative with his solutions and devise a different idea to cope with the situation. So engineers used hydraulic jacks to support the sides of the arch. False work was a much better approach as the solid rock bottom provided a much better foundation, but it is important to note that false work on a span of this size and magnitude had never been used, so it was a new experiment. An earlier cantilever and suspension design was rejected since it would have necessitated abutment towers and heavy anchorages. The crew used 40 truss segments that would be assembled off-site, then brought to the bridge, propped up into position, and joined to the previously assembled section. Construction commenced in September of 1928, with the project's final completion date set in 1932. It was supposed to cost $16 million to construct, which comes to around $273 million today. However, it only cost $13 million or $222 million when adjusted for inflation. Moreover, the bridge was constructed ahead of schedule, a full year before its deadline. Which is amazing, especially when considering that this was the longest single-bowed bridge in the world. The adage, haste makes waste, did not apply to this marvel of architecture and engineering. So how exactly did the city end up saving both time and money on this project? Cass Gilbert had proposed granite sheathing for the structure, but the Great Depression had hit the United States. To save the budget, those plans were scrapped, allowing the project to reduce both time and cost. The same was done in the case of the George Washington Bridge as well. It was not a major loss, as the Bayonne Bridge still turned out to be one of the most iconic sites in the region. Its elegant arches make it a sight to behold. The bridge has a span of 1,675 feet, 
the longest in the world at the time. The record was surpassed in 1977 by the New River Gorge Bridge in West Virginia with an arch of 1,700 feet. The Sydney Harbour Bridge that opened in Australia a year later fell just five feet short. Another impressive point was the Bayam Bridge's lightweight design. For context, the sister bridge in Sydney weighed about 70,000 short tons, whereas the Bayam Bridge weighed in at 16,000 short tons. The bridge opened for the public on November the 15th, 1931, and on that inaugural day, 17,000 vehicles and 7,000 pedestrians made their way across it. The Australian bridge, following a very similar design, began functioning just four months later. And it needs to be pointed out that the similarity between these two bridges was so symbolically important that they both featured a pair of engraved golden shears at inauguration where the governor of New Jersey, Morgan Larson, New York State Controller, Morris Tremaine, and the Secretary for Australia to the United States, David M. Dow, cut the ribbons at the Bayonne Bridge Toll Plaza. The shears were then sent to the mayor of North Sydney to cut the ribbon on the Sydney Harbour Bridge. They were later dismantled, so each country could keep one blade as a memento. In 1931, the American Institute for Steel Construction acknowledged that there is a symmetry and fineness of detail about the Bayonne Bridge that is impressive and almost haunting. They named it, quote, the most beautiful steel bridge in the world, ahead of the George Washington Bridge and the Anthony Wayne Bridge in Ohio. But the most impressive achievement of all is perhaps Amon and Gilbert's calculations. Building a bridge like this was unheard of at the time. There was no way to know if the theoretical calculations would yield practical rewards, and it was not always smooth sailing for the crew. Compression tests were done for various metals. Most importantly, of course, was manganese steel. It formed the largest columns and was being used for the first time on a project like this. The manganese steel was primarily used for the main arch ribbons and the one and a quarter inch rivets. It was chosen for its high strength and cheaper price compared to nickel steel, with the secondary stresses being reevaluated and measured on site. Workers employed the Bryan formula, which allowed engineers to figure out how much stress would cause the structure to buckle. Since minor issues are fairly common in big projects, the Swiss engineer's pioneering spirit remains commendable. When the Second World War reared its head, the space under the bridge became a storage site with the land below the bridge on the Staten Island side allegedly becoming a dumping ground for the Manhattan Project's uranium, with some claiming that radioactive materials polluted the site to no end and has not ever been completely cleaned up. With that being said, to the best of our research, it's very difficult to discern if this is New York legend or true history, with the post-war years brought a lot of little additions. In 1951, the city of Bayonne collaborated with the Port Authority to redesign the toll plaza and introduce shrubbery and benches. The Port Authority authorized the use of adjacent land for building Juliet Street Playground. A new toll plaza was added in 1964, and by 1970, toll collection was implemented at the Port Richmond Plaza for vehicles entering the island. The Verrazano's Narrows Bridge was also opened in 1964, providing a direct route from Staten Island to Brooklyn. The American Society of Civil Engineers, or ASCE, designated the Bayonne Bridge a National Historic Civil Engineering Landmark. Similarly, in 1988, they designated the Sydney Harbor Bridge as an International Historic Civil Engineering Landmark. By the 1990s, the traffic on the bridge proved no cause for concern, tarnishing the predictions of the bridge's original planners. The Bayonne Bridge is Staten Island's least used crossing with around 7 million vehicles every year. The four bridges made the commute so comfortable that you might even say New Yorkers started treating that old ferry like an adventure on the sea. The cost of a ferry ride to Staten Island never exceeded a quarter, and hence the ride itself is a nice deal. But then, in 1997, New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani showed his support to the people of Staten Island by eliminating that cost altogether. The ferry ride remains free to this day, but the important point is that Giuliani's gesture is indicative of a much larger trend. You see, whereas the traffic on the bridge may not have been alarming, 
the traffic below it certainly was. Over the decades, there has been an increase in maritime trade, and the technological advancements have led to much bigger vessels. This effect has been felt in the Kilvan Kol. In addition to the ships getting larger, naval traffic has also increased. The bridge was too low for large containers, and high tide only made things more complicated, even for medium-sized ships. A lot of regular-sized vessels would often wait for low tide or fold down antennas and mast. The port of New York and New Jersey could potentially lose a lot of business to other ports like South Carolina and Charleston, and something had to be done. The Port Authority, which was renamed to the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey in 1972, commissioned the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to analyze and study the situation in 2009. They authorized $10 million to the Corps for planning and engineering a worthwhile solution. Different options were considered, including building a new cable-stayed bridge costing approximately $2.15 billion USD, which at the time would have been completed by 2022, then there was a tunnel proposition costing two to $2.3 billion that would have been constructed by 2024. And then finally, there was the concept of a vertical lift span, which was quickly abandoned. Ultimately, the team spent $1.7 billion to raise the bridge's roadway in 2019. The 150 feet were not enough, so they raised the bridge's roadway by 215 feet. The U.S. Coast Guard was asked to do an environmental review. The review cost $2 million, contained 5,000 pages of review, and took four years to complete, making it their quickest review for a major project. However, the toxic waste we alluded to earlier was still said to be there. So the Newark and Staten Island residents demanded a full environmental review, but the Port Authority decided to make do with an expedited version of the process. So in turn, a Staten Island community group, the North Shore Waterfront Conservancy, filed a complaint with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency against the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. The complaint pointed out that the Port Authority had failed to factor in lead, PCBs, and asbestos that would be released into the air. The authority responded that it had developed a construction, health, and safety plan to ensure federal and state regulations were followed. However, during construction, area residents complained of dust clouds billowing in front of their houses and paint chips on the sidewalks, not to mention the constant sound of machinery at night. Noise and debris became a big concern, hence the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey announced the Raise the Road project starting in 2013 and finishing in 2017, with an assumed cost of around $1 billion. There was a reason for this hassle. The expansion of the Panama Canal was to be completed by 2016, allowing larger ships from Asia to reach the East Coast. Hence, streamlining this process helped the government bring in more business. From there, the Port Authority shortlisted five companies for the job in 2012, and by 2013, the Port Authority awarded a $743 million contract to a joint venture, and almost immediately, construction started on a roadway above the current one. The arch would be sustained for its iconic look and stature. Support columns were built, and gantry trains placed prefabricated road segments into position while a temporary beam supported the existing roadway. New floor beams were attached to the arches ropes and support steel stringers. The walkway was quickly closed for reconstruction and the old roadway was eventually removed. It was also planned that the new roadway would increase lane width from 10 feet to 12. However, unfavorable weather conditions caused massive delays on the project, which as you might imagine, caused negative effects to the port traffic and commerce. So with that in mind, a revised timeline was announced. The then U.S. President, Barack Obama, insisted that the state governments of New York and New Jersey make the project a priority, as it would help the national economy by facilitating crucial ports. In February of 2017, the Eastern Roadway opened for traffic. The two lanes continued to function as they had before, while work continued on the two new lanes. Eventually, the project widened the road deck from 40 feet to 60, providing wider lanes, 
shoulders, a medium barrier, and a bike path added in May of 2019. The Port Authority installed a fully automated and cashless electronic toll collection system. The Western roadway traffic was completed in February of 2019, allowing traffic to flow in two lanes in each direction. The Bayonne Bridge has continued to function as intended, as well as becoming something of an icon in pop culture from its 2005 feature in Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds, as well as an appearance in the HBO drama Oz. Then, in 2020, the ACE awarded the bridge for outstanding civil engineering achievements and also celebrated the restoration process for the crew's ability to keep both the road and the sea traffic open. The renovation of the Bayon Bridge is part of a larger narrative around the need for substantial investment in infrastructure across the United States. It highlights the importance of strategic infrastructure projects to improve transportation efficiency, enhance economic competitiveness, and address aging infrastructure. The architectural marvel stands as an emblem of American ingenuity and a symbol of progress and innovation. With that being said, I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, signing off.